Meanwhile, the U.S.-China rivalry is getting more intense. They're locked in a cold war, fighting on many fronts. One of the biggest flashpoints is chips or semiconductors. Chips are a strategic asset, the building blocks of modern technology. They power every gadget and device we use. And America controls the chip market. It controls the supply of the most advanced chips. China wants them, but the U.S. has imposed supply restrictions. There are sweeping sanctions. China does not have access to chips or chip-making tools. So what does Beijing do? Circumvent the curbs. American sanctions are porous, and China is exploiting those loopholes. Case in point, Huawei. China's tech giant and a global leader in 5G technology, Huawei has defeated American sanctions, it seems. They've launched a new smartphone. It's called Mate 60 Pro. Now, some geeks decided to open it up. What they found inside was an advanced chip. It's been called a breakthrough. This chip supports the latest 5G technology. It is speed, its speed is on par with the latest iPhones. And remember, this is despite U.S. restrictions. America has sanctioned Huawei. So China was not supposed to have this technology. How did they get it? This new chip is built by SMIC, the Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corporation. SMIC, it's a Chinese chip maker, partly funded by the government in Beijing. So Huawei's new phone runs on an SMIC chip. It has a name. Experts call this chip the new Kirin 9000S. It matches the speed of the new iPhones. And it's not easy to manufacture this chip. Making such an advanced chip is like creating a really tiny painting, like a microscopic masterpiece. The canvas is as small as your fingernail, and you have to fill it with a billion tiny paintings, so small that you cannot even see them. At the same time, the paintings have to be extremely detailed. This is how these advanced chips are made. There's a special process involved in it. It's called extreme ultraviolet lithography, or EUV for short, and you must know why this is so complicated. The canvas is the microchip. Instead of the paint, you're using light, and the drawings are transistors. What do the transistors do? They're like tiny switches. When you open a video on your computer or access an app on your phone, these tiny transistors work together to make that happen. So long story short, this process is both complex and precise. It's not an easy skill to master. Then how did China do it? How did they make their own advanced chip? Well, we don't have an answer. But we can tell you about some theories during the rounds. Apparently, this chip was made using cutting-edge European techniques, meaning European tools were used. So did Europe supply this technology to China? Well, that is unlikely because the transfer of this technology is also restricted. Then how did Beijing get it? Two possibilities. Either China bought the tools before the restrictions came into force, or they stole it. And neither possibility can be ruled out. You see, before the sanction kicked in, China made large purchases of semiconductors, so Huawei could just be getting chips from an old stockpile. But recent reports also say that Huawei was trying to skirt Western sanctions. It is building a secret manufacturing network. Huawei has bought up chip-making plants. What they're really after is chip-making equipment. And all of this was done with utmost secrecy. Huawei is said to have hidden the fact that it owns these plants, apparently to evade Western sanctions. And the company is clearly getting help from Beijing, including but not limited to state funding. China is said to have given Huawei around $30 billion. What are the funds for? to expand chip production. For Beijing, this is top priority. They want to close the gap with America, and they're pumping in more money. China is set to launch a new state-backed investment fund. The plan is to raise $40 billion, 4-0, 40 billion, and invest this money in chip making. Where will the money come from? The Chinese state will provide some 60 billion yuan. That's more than $8 billion. What about the rest? Well, we don't know yet, but we do know that Xi Jinping is very keen on the project. He wants self-reliance in technology. The Chinese president is making an aggressive push. In the past, he has pulled up Chinese companies. He said they were not making enough progress. Xi Jinping believes semiconductors are as important for the country as the heart is for the human body. Not making this up, I have a quote from the Chinese president. When your heart is not strong, no matter how big you are, you're not really strong. This is from 2018. 
This is what he said to some executives from a chip-making company. He wanted them to step up, to do more. And it seems he's got his wish. China is making rapid advances as America's policy of sanctions suffers yet another setback. Now let's turn our attention to another theater of colonization, the Pacific. Pacific Island nations are in the middle of a new battle, a battle for influence. On one side, you have the West, led by the big brother, America, and its deputy in the region, Australia. The West has long considered the Pacific its backyard. But off late, China has been trying to bring Pacific Island nations over to its side, trying to wean them away from the West using lavish gifts and insidious agreements. The gifts include your usual loans and infrastructure projects, but also unique offerings like a $74 million stadium. That's right, China has built and gifted a multi-million dollar stadium to the Solomon Islands. These islands are located close to Australia. They're a nation of about 700,000 people and one of the poorer Pacific Island nations. They're set to host the Pacific Games this November. It's the first time the Solomon Islands are hosting the Games and the stadium is apparently a gift from China. The plan was, was this. The Solomons would fund 20% of the infrastructure for the games and the remaining 80% would be funded by foreign sources. And most of this money came from China. We are talking about investment close to $119 million. That's what China has spent on the Pacific Games. Quite a generous gift, you would say. But China is not known for handing out free money. Countries in its debt like Sri Lanka and Pakistan can attest to that then what's the catch here? Beijing says there is no catch, that the stadium and other facilities were given with no strings attached, apart from the fact, of course, that they signed a shady deal, a security deal between China and the Solomons. It was signed last year. China will train the security forces of this island nations, like their police force. And they were to be trained with replica guns sent by China. Sounds all kinds of shady and dubious. Why send replica guns? Turns out they were real after all, which marks another twist in this tale, really. Is China secretly sending weapons to the Solomon Islands? A new report cites American diplomatic cables. They say these Chinese guns were not replicas. Last year, a shipment came from China. It bypassed the port authorities at Solomon Islands. The shipment was unloaded in the middle of the night with no proper documentation. And all this set off a political storm in the Solomons. That's when the government said, that these were replica weapons. They produced replica weapons. They said all accusations were wrong. But the US does not buy this explanation. It believes that China has been sending genuine weapons with unique serial numbers. It's yet to be confirmed. But if it is, it will show China's ambitions. Sending weapons to the Solomons means a closer alignment. Also, a new weapons market for China, creating a dependency and moving in the West's traditional turf. The government in the Solomons denies all of it, of course. And it's not the only country caught in the turf war between China and the West. As you move south from the Solomons, you arrive at Vanuatu, a country of about 330,000 people. It is in danger of being swallowed by the ocean. It's at the forefront of climate change. Also increasingly, at the forefront of the China-West influence war. Last year, Vanuatu signed a security pact with Australia. It was negotiated by their prime minister. The man was ousted yesterday. He faced a no-confidence motion. He was ousted. He was accused of putting Vanuatu's neutrality at risk by signing the security pact with Australia. So he was removed even before the pact could be ratified by his country's parliament. Now, a new man has taken charge. His name is Sato Kilman. He says the security deal will have to be revisited. And that's one of the first things that he said after taking office. The new prime minister has been accused of being pro-China. When asked about his stance, he said, we are not pro-West, we are not pro-Chinese. We adopt a non-aligned policy, which is a noble sentiment, but can he really pull it off? The Pacific Island nations are in a unique position. They are being courted by rival powers. They could potentially play the West and China against each other to reap the benefits. But both factions have a history of exploitation. The West and its history of colonization, and China and its newfound love for debt trap diplomacy. If the Pacific Island nations are not careful, all these pacts and gifts could turn into a trap. The gifted stadiums could end up becoming gilded cages.
The European Union has declared war, and I know what you're thinking. No, it's not a war against Russia, not yet at least. What we're talking about tonight is a war on wolves. There are strictly protected species in the European Union, meaning you cannot capture or kill them. But now their number has exploded, and the return of the wolves poses a danger, especially to livestock and human life. So the European Commission wants to review their protection status, and championing this cause is the EU chief herself, Ursula von der Leyen. She is pushing for the change. Our next report tells you why. It was the night of September 1st, 2022. A male wolf was prowling in Lower Saxony, a rural area in northwest Germany. The wolf used the darkness as its cover. It sneaked into a well-guarded compound and ended up killing a pony. But it turns out, this wasn't just any other pony. It was 30-year-old Dolly a pony that belonged to EU chief Ursula von der Leyen. The kill may have been random, but the fate of the wolf was sealed. It became enemy number one for the European Union. Officials issued kill orders. There was a bounty on its head. But all of that was in vain, because the wolf that killed von der Leyen's beloved pony was never caught. However, the EU chief seems to have not given up. One wolf may have evaded her, but Brussels now has its sight on all the wolves across the continent. Wolves roamed Europe long before humans, but they soon became extinct. That's due to rampant hunting. They were extinct in much of Western Europe. After having been systematically eradicated, the numbers have only gone up in the last decade. That's when wolves were designated as a protected species. It means you can't kill or hunt them. Europe currently has around 19,000 wolves and in Germany, there are around 1,200 wolves. So the numbers have gone up, but not everyone is happy, like Ursula von der Leyen. She lost her beloved pony, just like other farmers who lose their livestock to wolves. Complaints have been growing. EU states have seen a dramatic increase in the number of livestock killed. In Austria, livestock killed by wolves increased by 230% in 2021. So now farmers want the right to shoot them, and the EU chief agrees. The European Commission now wants to review the protection status of wolves, but conservationists have slammed this move. They say the recovery of the wolf population has been slow, and it must be celebrated, not culled. So what will it be for Europe? Will they declare a war on wolves or will they come to the howling consensus that coexistence is better than culling? To Africa now, where a historic climate summit is taking place in Kenya. Nairobi is hosting delegates from across the African continent. The goal is to decide on a way towards sustainable development. And this is the first such summit in Africa. It's a way for the continent to take charge instead of always ending up the victims of extreme climate. But the way forward is not clear. Some countries want to bypass fossil fuel-led growth. They want to transition directly to green energy. Other nations, the ones who have massive fossil fuel deposits, do not want that, obviously. They want to exploit their natural resources to achieve economic prosperity. It's a tough debate. Made tougher by protesters. People have taken to the streets of Nairobi. They demand an end to energy neo-colonialism. They say Africa's resources should be used to uplift the continent and not as a safety net for the polluting activities of the developing world. Here's a report. In the fight against climate change, Africa has entered the arena. The Africa Climate Summit 2023 is taking place. It's being held in Kenya's capital, Nairobi. The city has become the stage for the climate battle. But as great as the summit is, it isn't without controversy. The participating nations have yet to agree on a way forward. And delegates from other parts of the world are pushing their own agenda. Which has left many fearful for the path Africa will take. You see, the continent has been getting a raw deal. It's home to about 1.46 billion people. 
that's about 17% of the world's population. Yet, it emits far fewer greenhouse gases than the developed world. The US and China are the biggest greenhouse gas emitters on the planet. They are the chief contributors to the climate crisis. And it's Africa that unfairly bears the brunt of extreme weather brought about by climate change. This continent accounts for less than 4% of global emissions, yet it suffers some of the worst effects of rising global temperatures. Extreme heat, ferocious floods, and tens of thousands dead from devastating droughts. The African continent isn't alone, of course. Many countries with negligible carbon footprints suffer the adverse effects of climate change. This is around the world. The collective global south pays for the sins of the developed world. But Africa is emerging as a solution. The continent has the potential to generate massive amounts of clean energy. Solar, wind, hydroelectric, everything is possible in Africa. And some African countries have been harnessing these green sources. It is quite incredible, significant, that Kenya is now at about 91%. Uh, renewable, and by 2025 anticipates being at about 95 plus percent renewable, and they're growing. So I think that uh, it's clear that uh, this will be a proving and a testing ground in these next few years uh, for uh, what's possible. The summit host Kenya is at the forefront of renewable energy generation. And President William Ruto is championing green growth. He has a plan. Let Africa bypass the fossil fuel-based growth of the West. Instead, the continent should move directly to clean energy, develop that capacity, and then sell it to the rest of the world. Not just energy, but carbon credits. The restoration and expansion of Africa's natural carbon sinks are just are not just an environmental imperative, in fact. They are an unparalleled economic goldmine. Carbon credits are almost a transfer of responsibility. A polluting country can continue polluting if it buys carbon credits. It can pay green countries for their share of pollution capacity. This way, greenhouse gases don't really get reduced, they just don't increase. It's better than nothing, but not ideal. However, the system has the potential to enrich green countries, which is what Ruto wants to do. And there are backers for this. Yesterday, the UAE pledged to buy $450 million worth of carbon credits. Other nations like the UK and Germany are planning debt swaps and green projects. Here's what the EU said. We're not only interested in extracting resources. We want to partner with you to create local value chains, to create good jobs here in Africa. We want to share European te technology with you. We want to invest in skills for local workers. This is crucial for the young people. Basically, they're trying to make Africa the green hub of the world while they continue their polluting ways. On the other side of the debate are African countries with fossil fuel deposits of their own. Nigeria, Niger, Senegal all have oil. They want to use it to enrich their people, like some of the Arab states have managed to do. There are some African nations who have done this, like Gabon, which is both an oil exporter and a very green country. It has a massive amount of forest cover, a potential way to earn millions in carbon credits. But the recent coup there has shown that this wealth wasn't distributed among the people. Gabon's natural resources were exploited, but not everyone benefited. So some climate activists are against both the plans. They want green energy production, but only for Africa's benefit. We are here to demand that Africa's energy system must be decolonized. It must be brought out from the hands of the corporates. We want renewable energy now. We want, clean, we want sustainable energy in Africa now. Africa is capable of uh, clean energy and driving sustainable change towards a better future. The protesters want climate justice. They want climate neocolonization to end. 
They want Africa to benefit first from its resources. But in a world that has exploited Africa for centuries, will their voices be heard? And now it's time for Vantage Shorts images that tell the story. Gender reveal parties are supposed to be a happy occasion, but this one in Mexico went horribly wrong. The plane releasing the pink smoke on the expectant couple crashed, killing the pilot. In Iraq, millions of Shiite Muslims gathered in the holy city of Karbala for the Shiite pilgrimage of Arbaeen. And sometimes a lap can be really costly for an athlete, like this athlete who got confused and went for an extra lap, missing his lead in the triathlon. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day, in 1972, the Summer Olympic Games in Munich took a tragic turn. Palestinian gunmen attacked the Israeli team and took them hostage. 11 people were killed after a botched rescue operation. The attack caused a deep rift between Germany and Israel. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. We've crossed 2 million subscribers on YouTube. This is arguably the fastest growing news platform and we can't thank you enough for fueling this growth. All those of you who join us every day to watch this show and more, thank you. We launched Vantage seven months ago and these have been some very rewarding seven months for us. So from the entire team here, heartfelt gratitude.